Hello everybody and welcome to episode 3 of Queer History. In the last episode we talked about Alan Turing, a gay Olympic level athlete, mathematical genius, codebreaker and basically the founder of IT sciences as we know it today. In this episode we are going to talk about a mythical poet from antiquity, namely Sappho of Lesbos. It is thanks to Sappho that we use the term lesbian for women who love women. But who was Sappho? And what do we know of her? This and more in this episode of Queer History. Let's start off with a general introduction. Who was Sappho? Sappho was a lyrical poet who lived from 620 BC up to 570 BC. She was born into a family of aristocrats on the island of Lesbos in the Greek peninsula. Due to the cultural position of women on the island of Lesbos and Sappho her own strong mind, it was possible for her to live a life of her own choosing. There are researchers out there that are suggesting that she could do this because of her family's wealth. And that might have made it easier for her, but I strongly believe that it isn't just due to her wealth. Yes, it made it easier because she didn't have to worry about her own survival, but I think that in the culture of Lesbos, women were held in a high regard, and that way she enjoyed more freedom and more respect from people on the island, giving her the opportunity to explore her own path. In Athens, there were probably lots of wealthy aristocrat ladies out there as well. But the culture there was different. Women weren't held in the same kind of high esteem. So we have a lot less records from women rising to unique positions in the system of Athens. And that is why I think that Sappho, her own mind and the cultural impact of Lesbos is more important than the wealth of her family. If you enjoy historical and LGBTQ plus content, don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below. In order to understand the culture on Lesbos, we have to talk about Sibylle. Sibylle was one of the main goddesses that was revered on the island of Lesbos. And that's important because the culture in Lesbos, like on many other Greek city-states, was very influenced by the religion. There are many findings on the island referencing to the ancient Anatolian mother goddess Sibylle. Sibylle was associated with motherhood, fertility and the wild mountains. The deity is associated with strong female aspects like caring, fertility, motherhood. Her worship was mostly attended by women. Sibylle is also one of the goddesses of what we have the most found on the island of Lesbos, suggesting that she had a very big following there, making Sibylle one of the biggest goddesses on the island of Lesbos. Combine this with the fact that Greek life was dominated by religion and worship, making one of the biggest goddesses in the pantheon on the island of Lesbos being Sibylle, the mother, puts women on a position of high esteem because one of the highest goddesses that is revered is a woman herself. This in general put women in a culturally powerful position. With that, Sappho was put in a culturally powerful position because she was a woman living on the island of Lesbos. Because it is this context that shaped her and that gave her the opportunities to do what she did. Now it's time that we talk a little bit about Sappho, her life. We don't really know that much about Sappho. Most things that we know are written down by others. And those others usually lived in a different time period than she did, making them non-contemporary sources. And there are her works, and works from a person aren't necessarily a good reference, because the works can be altered, they can have a certain goal. And that being said, there aren't even that many of her works left. There used to be nine volumes of her. Of those nine volumes, only 650 lines of text remain. So we lost a great amount of text. From the text that remain, we mostly have partial bits. So we can reconstruct parts of the poems that she wrote, but we can't reconstruct the entire poem, leaving out a lot of information and a lot of context, making it hard to make judgments about Sappho as a person based on her poems because they aren't intended as autobiographical, but they also aren't complete anymore. Of those 650 lines, those are also written in Archaic Greek. Who of us speaks Archaic Greek? Almost no one. Most of us know modern day Greek, know some kind of things, but they have to be translated. And things get lost in translation. So it's not a very reliable source to use your own poems to talk about her. Then there is the Suda. The Suda is a historical codex written in the Byzantine Empire in the 10th century AC, after Christ. For those of you who don't know, that's 1500 years after Sappho lived. That would be similar as me writing a historical codex about the fall of the Roman Empire. That happened 1500 years ago. 
Let that sink in for a moment and think to yourself, would that be a trustworthy source? So to recap, we have people who wrote about her who weren't her contemporaries. We have her own poems of which we miss. Big parts are written in a language that we barely understand or barely know and that aren't intended to be autobiographical. And then there is a document that's written 1500 years after she died. Those aren't great sources, but it's all we have, so we have to make it work. While these sources aren't the best out there, we can definitely make some assumptions about Sappho, her life. Sappho was a woman that was well known throughout the ancient world. People have called her the 10th muse. If you don't know, Greek mythology has nine muses for every form of art, so being called the 10th muse is quite a compliment. This suggested that she was very inspiring in her artistic endeavors and people strive to be like her in their artistic endeavors. In her adult life, Sappho also run the school. I use the word school here because it's the closest thing that we got, but it doesn't really fit the definition of a school as we know it. But we don't have a better word for it. Wealthy aristocrat daughters got sent to this school to prepare them for marriage. This was by studying the fine arts, learning how to entertain, how to be a poet themselves. Because in Greek society, the women had the job of entertaining. So it was important things to know. It gave your daughter a better chance to be married off to a wealthy husband, which was good for her, but also for your family standing. Part of these studies were also the matters of the heart and everything that comes with it. The romantic and the sexual. The patron deity of this school of sorts was Aphrodite. Aphrodite was a goddess of love and beauty. This led that a lot of Sappho her poems are directed at Aphrodite, speaking about love and about beauty. Her family was probably a family of vintners, people who make, sell, buy and export wine. She was exiled to Sicily twice because of her political views. Radical lesbians changing the political landscape. It's always a thing we support. She had three brothers. And at some point she was so famous, people started to raise statues in her honor. People started minting coins with her face on it. Talking about Sappho coins, let's talk about Sappho as a lesbian. Because that's how most people think about her nowadays. It is generally accepted that Sappho was gay. That being said, she also had a husband at some point, apparently. Because of her popularity, the meaning of the word lesbians changed from one who is from Lesbos to one who loves other women. An example can be found in a poem by Anacreon. Not that girl. She's the other kind, one from Lesbos. Disdainfully, nose turned up at my silver hair. She makes eyes at the ladies. But what about Sappho herself? What do we know about her sexuality? What has she said about it? There is no written confession of sexual attraction by Sappho. And since time travel isn't invented yet, we can only speculate on this. The poems that she wrote were definitely gay. But did that make her gay? Does your work being gay equals you being gay? If we, for example, look at fragment 31, we see from Sappho's perspective an intense desire for a woman that is talking to a man and that is being talked to. The perspective is the perspective of the writer is one of observance, observing what happens in her body by the idea that she would be talking to that woman, how badly that she would want it, almost turning it into a perspective of desire. He seems to me an equal of the gods. Whoever gets to sit across from you and listen to the sound of your sweet speech so close to him, to your beguiling laughter, oh it makes my panicked heart go fluttering in my chest. For the moment I catch sight of you, there's no speech left in me. But tongue gags all at once a faint. Fever courses down beneath the skin. Eyes no longer capable of sight. A thrumming in the ears. And sweat drips down my body. And the shakes lay siege to me all over. And I'm greener than grass. I'm just a little short of dying. I seem to me, but all must be endured since even a pauper. Of course, sadly, it is as with most of her poems that we miss the final lines of this poem, making us lean on speculation as our best friend in interpreting the works of Sappho. When we read these kind of words from Sappho, we try and understand how she feels, but she describes the intense attraction, the feeling of desire in such a guttural sense that 
we can only speculate that these are based on feelings that she actually had. That she was actually attracted to the women sitting there talking to the man. And there are also other writers out there who suggested that Sappho acted as a masculine woman. Whatever they might imply. Based on those sources, we could say that Sappho was a masked lesbian. And there's also the context of ancient Greek society and sexuality. Sadly, we don't know a lot about this from the female perspective. The video file got corrupted uh, during the recording, so enjoy the random clip that I throw in here. We do know, however, that in the male society, there was a certain level of acceptance for male loving male relationships. Usually this was in a bit of a power dynamic of the older man being a tutor of a younger man. And this older man taught the younger man how to live a good life. And part of that was also how to have decent sexual relations with the practical bits in there. In a culture where women had such a powerful position as in the island of Lesbos, it wouldn't be a stretch to think that these kind of relations would also exist from woman to woman. Or an older woman the pupil of sorts and also taught them about love, about beauty, about sex. Nowadays we think this is insane, but this was a normal thing that happened in the ancient Greek society. Combine this piece of knowledge with the writing, the type of writing, the intense feelings of desire that is towards women in the writing, and that paints a pretty clear picture for us. So, to answer the question, what was that for her sexuality? We don't know. We just don't. Sorry. With the given information, we can make an educated guess that Sappho definitely felt an attraction to other women. That being said, the study of Sappho is one that's ever-changing. As soon as there's a new translation, something new comes out, a new fragment of her poems are found, the entire story of Sappho can be rewritten. So, was Sappho a lesbian? Maybe. Probably. All of the above? We don't know. What might be a way more fascinating question is, would Sappho herself see herself as a lesbian? And in this context, I mean the women loving women kind, not the resident of the island of Lesbos, because she probably would have seen herself as a resident of the island of Lesbos, so consider herself a lesbian. But we are talking about lesbian in the women loving women kind. I don't think she would call herself a lesbian. The term lesbian is a defining term for women loving women. Sappho never really defined her own sexuality, leaving her precise attractions in the grey. Do I think Sappho loved other women? Definitely. Would she call herself a lesbian? I don't think so. The Greeks had a different way of defining sexuality. An older man who did something with a younger man wouldn't call themselves gay. It was part of their culture, it was part of something that was just happening. So I don't think Sappho would have seen herself differently from any other women out there and wouldn't need the definition of lesbian to differ herself because it was one of the normalest things that was happening there probably. But as I said, Sappho definitely loved other women and that alone is a reason enough to nowadays, in the modern times, remember her. Sappho is a queer icon, whether or not she would have identified herself as a lesbian or not. Why? Because Sappho is one of those icons that shows us that being queer is part of human nature. It isn't something of the past 150 years. It goes back all the way to antiquity, 2500 years. So yeah, that's why Sappho is a queer icon. In her work, we also see somebody who isn't afraid to show themselves, to express themselves through an artistic medium. Her work is still relevant 25 centuries after her death. There aren't a lot of people who can say that. Not even the Bible can make that claim. Sappho didn't let cultural norms define her life. She was exiled to Sicily twice because she went against the politics of the island. I mean, that isn't letting yourself be defined by customs. Sappho is an inspiration, and while she probably wouldn't have called herself a lesbian in the woman loving woman kind, she's definitely somebody we as the queer community could look up to, to not let ourselves be defined by cultural norms, to tell people how we feel to express ourselves and to show people hey it's okay to love somebody of the same gender it's happened for 2500 years here's an example i think you would be proud that nowadays women loving women can be called sapphic love in regards to her so that was the video about sapphic and i have to be honest here writing this was quite tough i studied to become a history teacher not a historian I would like to be a historian, so please subscribe so that I can get there. 
And during my study as a history teacher, we definitely learned how to do source research. And we definitely learned how to judge sources based on their objectivity, how to use, which one to use, which ones to avoid. And that's what I try to apply in the script writing of this video. I am definitely not one of the best historical researchers out there. And Sappho didn't make this easier on me. There are so many sources out there. There are so much, so many bad sources out there, so many outdated sources out there. Yet I had a very fun time writing this and learning about this historical figure. You're watching this and you're looking at the third version of the script. I hope you enjoyed it. I really hope you did. I am proud of the work I delivered. I hope the editing turns out good. As the sources for this script, I used various websites, historical sources, articles and books that I haven't written down because I'm a bad person. And there's a big dose of personal interpretation in there. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like if you enjoyed this video. Let me know down in the comments who you would want me to research and talk about next. Next video is going to be about Magnus Hirschfeld. Bye bye.